All right, people, this is the Rubin Report direct message. And I have to start with some condemnations and some things that I need to disavow. We live in a time where you must disavow things and you must do it when other people want you to do it and you must do it immediately and then you must do it repeatedly ad nauseum. So I just, I scribbled a few things down and I just wanna get out there, I wanna get ahead of things, you know what I mean? I wanna get ahead of the news curve and I want to disavow and condemn a whole bunch of stuff, so please just bear with me uh, for the beginning here. I wanna disavow white supremacy, okay? I'm disavowing completely. I want nothing to do with it. Uh, I also wanna disavow black supremacy. Not good, don't wanna do it, I don't like it, okay? I also wanna disavow Asian supremacy, okay? That, we're not gonna be doing that around here, okay? That's for sure. Jewish supremacy, no good, sorry Jews, not gonna do it, all right? Latino supremacy, also not a good one, no mas, okay? We're not gonna do that anymore. Gay supremacy, sorry, no, we're not doing it, I'm disavowing completely. Uh, trans supremacy, no, I don't believe in it, and I wanna be very specific about that when I'm talking about Decepticon supremacy, so that goes for Megatron, Starscream, Soundwave, Shockwave, the whole Thundercracker, the whole crew, all right? No. No, we're not gonna do it. I wanna disavow blind supremacy. You see a lot of blind people out there with the stick and they're poking you. No, 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 no. Uh, deaf supremacy, not, not gonna do it. And I don't know that we're, are we putting subtitles on this? Because that one might slip through the cracks. I also wanna disavow tall supremacy because you know these tall people always looking down on everybody and it's just enough of that. And of course, short supremacy because you know a lot of short people, they're always, you know, they've got a little bit of a, a little, I'm better than you because I, you know, sometimes you're looking straight away, you don't see what's there and then they, they think you're better. The one thing that I don't want to distance myself from, and I wanna be very clear about this, okay? So I've just denounced, I've disavowed, this is what you gotta do, it's 2020. I wanna be very clear that I am in no way denouncing um, evil alien robot supremacy because uh, I, for one, welcome our new overlords when they come because <laughs> it can't get crazier. All right, people, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening right now, and uh, it starts with condemnations and disavowing. So we're doing, uh, we're doing three stories in today's direct message, and uh, the first story that we're gonna talk about, obviously, is the firestorm over Trump either disavowing or not disavowing white supremacy. Depending on uh, where you fall politically, you saw some very different things uh, that happened during the debate the other night. I've already gone into this. I, I discussed that he slightly butchered the answer. That's what I said immediately after the debate, before I saw the media firestorm, uh, because he, he, when he was asked the question by Chris Wallace about white supremacy, because our media is so defunct and delegitimate and everything else, he needed to repeat the question like a fifth grader writing an answer on a test. He needed to say, I, Donald J. Trump, disavow, condemn white supremacy. Now he's done this a million times before and we're gonna get to that in just a second, but the way he butchered it when he just said, sure, it gives room for the media to jump in. And of course that's what the media is doing. But I thought what I would show you first is uh, a clip that is absolutely catching fire on Twitter right now and I'm glad that it is. It, uh, I tweeted it out, it was po posted by somebody before me, but I tweeted it out and, and it's just catching fire everywhere. Uh, this is from a debate in 2016. Uh, that's four years ago. Uh, and remember, now everyone's saying Donald Trump refuses to uh, condemn and disavow white supremacy. Uh, this is a debate in 2016, and you're not gonna believe this. Guess who the moderator of the debate is? Chris Wallace. And guess what the question is? Will you disavow white supremacy? And let's go to the videotape. I totally disavow the Ku Klux Klan. I totally disavow David Duke. I've been doing it now for two weeks. This is, you're probably about the 18th person that's asked me the question. It was very clear. That question was also talked about in the form of groups, groups. I want to know which groups are you talking about? You have to tell me which groups. Ultimately, he got to the Ku Klux Klan, which obviously I'm going to disavow. And by the way, if you look on my Twitter account, almost immediately after the program, they were disavowed again. You know, it's amazing. When I do something on Twitter, everybody picks it up, goes all over the place. But when I did this one, nobody ever picks it up. Take a look at my Twitter account. 
Thank you, sir. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Senator Rubin. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities, as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland? Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do this? Okay, so we didn't even need to show you his response there. I showed it to you the other day. You've seen the clip a million times. So that is Chris Wallace, the same guy, asking the same exact question four years ago. He heard Trump's answer. The media has all heard Trump's answer. They've heard it repeatedly, but they keep running with this nonsense. So then today at the White House press briefing, press secretary Kayla McCarthy was asked a question by John Roberts about Donald Trump further disavowing and condemning white supremacy. Let's take a look. If I could start off, um, I'd like to ask you for a definitive and declarative statement without ambiguity or deflection. As the person who speaks for the president, does the president denounce white supremacism and groups that espouse it in all their forms? This has been answered yesterday by the president himself, the day before by the president himself on the debate stage. The president was asked this. He said, sure, three times. Yesterday, he was point blank, blank asked, do you uh, denounce white supremacy? And he said, I've always denounced any form of that. I can go back and read for you um, in August 2019 in one voice our nation must condemn racism, bigotry, and white supremacy. In August of 2017, racism is evil, and those who cause violence in its name are criminals and thugs, including the KKK, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and other hate groups. I have an entire list of these quotes that I can go through with you. But he has condemned but, white supremacy more than any president but, in modern history. Just to clear it up this morning, can you, naming it, make a declarative statement that you denounce, that the president denounces it? I just did. Uh, the president has denounced this. Repeatedly, the, the you, president was asked this. You're you just, making, you're contriving a no, storyline and a narrative. I'm just asking you to put he this said, to rest. I just did. I read you all of the quotes, and if you need quotes. to see them in can writing, I will put them in an email. Hold on. So, Kaylee, can, can, can you right now denounce white supremacy and the group I that just is The president has denounced white supremacy, the, the KKK, and hate groups in all forms. He signed a resolution to that effect. Uh, the president just last week, perhaps you all weren't covering it, but just last week expressed his desire to see the KKK prosecuted as domestic terrorists. This president uh, had advocated for the death penalty for a white supremacist, the first federal execution in 17 years. His record on this is unmistakable, and it's shameful that the media All right, so I think by watching that unedited clip, because I show you unedited things, even though, again, I'm not a journalist, I wish somebody, I wish we had journalists, I'd find something else to do. Um, in that unedited clip, it's pretty unambiguous that the man is condemning the KKK and has done it in the past, David Duke, and has done it in the past, white supremacy. She even mentions that he wants to prosecute uh, these groups as domestic terrorists. Um, she answers the question repeatedly and clearly. Now, John, uh, what, John Fox? Wait, I'm, it's not John Fox. What? John Roberts. <laughs> John Fox. He's on Fox. Uh, John Roberts. I, I usually think is a pretty decent reporter, from what I can tell. So I don't know what he's going for there. Um, but what they're really trying to do, and and then of course, you know, these clips are being spread all over the place that Kaylee doesn't condemn white supremacy, dances around question, blah, blah, blah. She's literally reading statement after statement of what the guy has said over years. But you know, the media, the media is just dead and the usual suspects tweeted out as if he didn't condemn white supremacy. I had to tweet at David from today because of his nonsense. And then uh, one of these guys, this guy, Aaron something at Vox, I try not to make it about the people, um, but it's like, you're a journalist at Vox and he tweets out the clip. And again, it's the implication. No, she's dancing around it. She didn't say he's against white supremacy or anything like that. It's in the freaking clip. It, this is what gaslighting is. And I think what, what Trump is realizing, and I'm glad to see so much pushback against it today, um, is that gaslighting, in effect, is when you know you've done something and your opponents do the complete reverse. They do something so over the top that you just have to keep dancing for them at, while the house burned down around you. And I think Trump fully understands that this is the way the media plays and has played for a long time. And I think what he's doing is mapping a path, basically, for other people, in this case, mostly conservatives or right-leaning people, to not back down 
to the nonsense and not back down to the mob. You're seeing the mob. You're, this is, when you talk about cancel culture and the mob and everything else, you're seeing it in action right now. What are all these people that are telling you that Trump won't denounce white supremacy and everything else? And I played the clip from Charlottesville the other day where he absolutely denounces the neo-Nazis and the KKK. And even, uh, I just tweeted out this morning, Bernie Sanders has a tweet from yesterday where he uses the very fine people on both sides hoax. Now, for some reason, Twitter doesn't put a, oh, this is factually untrue when Bernie Sanders does it. So we know that there's a that there's a political leaning and that's a whole bigger conversation related to big tech and everything else. But what Trump is doing is basically mapping people and he's showing, you know, the mob is gonna come for you if you if you say something that is true and you have a track record of saying it and everything else, they'll still come for you never been the knee. So I'm glad to see so many people have just absolutely had it. And and the media is burning down their old ha their own house. Is this what you guys want to do? Is this what you guys want to do? I, I did it the other day, but here, I'll talk directly to you here. I'm going to do a Joe Biden. Joe Biden likes looking in the camera and I'm talking to you, the American people. I find it very creepy, actually. Um, I'll talk to you directly, Jake Tapper and Brian Stelter and Wolf Blitzer and Don Lemon and whoever else. Guys, play the clip of Trump and the very fine hoax thing and show that that is a hoax. Show that that's a hoax and I'll give you credit, gladly give you credit. Most people will give you credit. The problem is the media is in the tank so far for the Democrats and they've dug it so deep and they never looked back. They never looked back when Trump became president, all they had to do was say, hey, maybe we did a little something wrong here. Maybe we were a little too biased and people we're voting against it. I actually think what's happening right now, in a weird way, it's like yesterday a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, Trump either lost the debate or certainly wasn't at his best and the fact that Biden's head didn't explode, Biden did okay. I actually think the narrative is shifting now where it's like they went in so deep on this nonsense about Trump not disavowing white supremacy that it's fueling, it's fueling the Trump people right now. I feel like they're being a little a little braver and a little more out there. And, and the media is just completely losing control. And again, I know I've said this a million times, so I'll make it quick, but this is why I did that video the day after the election, sitting in my backyard, we didn't, have, we didn't even have a studio. And I did this video saying, if you keep calling him a Nazi, you're gonna regret it, because you're gonna paint yourself into a corner. And when it turns out that he's not a Nazi, you can't turn around and say that the Nazi ain't that bad. So this is just an, an extension of everything. But I, I wanna say one other thing about Chris Wallace, look, I don't like attacking hosts and moderators. I know that as an interviewer, you're gonna make some mistakes. You're not gonna ask a follow-up question here. Someone might be able to get some misinformation in and you might miss it. Sometimes somebody says so many things at once that you can only pick one thing. Like, I'm not gonna pretend I'm perfect. I don't think Larry King would pretend that he was perfect. I don't think Johnny Carson would say that he was perfect. It, there's no perfect way of being an interviewer. I don't think Barbara Walters would say she was perfect. And there's also no perfect way of being a moderator. However, for Chris Wallace to ask virtually the same exact question four years later, knowing that he knew the answer, like if, if he felt, if he really, really felt that he had to ask Trump about white supremacy, even though it's not white supremacists that are burning down buildings, you know, West Hollywood here, uh, which is the gayest place on earth. They've got a, a rainbow crosswalk, okay? All the gay bars outside, it, 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 it couldn't get gayer. You could put glitter in a, you put a lot of glitter all over the place, okay? And, and it wouldn't be gayer. There is a lot of glitter over there. Um, the streets are lined with glitter. Um, it's the gayest place on earth and many of the buildings are still locked down. And they're locked down, the, the storefronts are still locked down and they've all got the signs, BLM and we're for peace and justice and diversity and all this stuff. And it's like, they're not locked down because they think their windows are gonna be broken by white supremacists. Where are the white supremacists running around breaking windows and stopping people on the street and burning down buildings? I don't know where they are. Could someone point to where they are? If someone can point it, please uh, let me know. Um, they're, they're doing it because they're afraid of Antifa and they're afraid of BLM. It's a protection racket. It's basically the mafia. You put up our sign or we're gonna burn your store down. Okay, so, Everybody's got this whole thing backwards. And I thought that intersectionality meant that you're supposed to be four gays. So why did they shut down basically the gayest place on earth? I mean, it's all. Dave, have some water. I don't, I don't have any water. Where's my water for God's sakes? <laughs> um, anyway, it's just, it's just a whole bunch of crazy nonsense. But what I am enthused about is that we've got a chance to fight back. That's what the online world is. You know, these people like to pretend they're the rebel resistance and actually 
they're the Death Star. They're the big governmental machine that always wants more power and wants to control how people think and live, right? What is, why did they want the Death Star? They wanted the Death Star so that every planet, this is what uh, Grand Moff Tarkin says at the beginning of Star Wars, they want the Death Star because they know the planets will all fall in line because if you got a big gun that can blow up a planet, well, then you're gonna do what they want. And in many ways, that is now the goal of the left, that they want the government to do everything. The government's evil and also give it more money and give it more power. Like that's what they were doing with the Death Star so that the planets, in this case, the states, or individual people can't make decisions for themselves because that thing will be so powerful. Um, I'll say one other thing about, about this, and when I said the, the Joe Biden keeps turning to the camera and talking to you like that, I was thinking, I meant to mention it yesterday, I was thinking as I was watching the debate, like, I don't want a politician that says he can solve all of my problems. If Trump was telling me I could, he could solve all my problems, or Biden or anyone else, it's like that line, that way of thinking that politicians or the government can solve all of your problems. They can't solve all of my problems. I actually can't imagine a problem that I could have. Uh, well, I can I can imagine if, if my house was on fire, then I would want the fire department to do something. And I do think that's a role for the government. Or if uh, someone was attacking me on the street, that is a role for the police and that's the government. But there's very few things where you're like, oh, I wish the government was here, you know? Like, no, they're not very good at things. And, and that's okay, by the way. And that's that's actually what our founders were warning us against. So this thing about the government's gonna do all the things, the government's gonna save you from the environment in 12 years. The government is gonna demand that you drive an electric car. The government is gonna do all these things. No, it's not going to be. I'd also like to condemn all of the people and disavow all of the people that think the government can do everything because it just can't. All right, I think you, I think you got the point on that one, people. Uh, let's move on to the second story. This is just, well, it's just an extension of everything. Like we're, we're just living in this time of what Ben Shapiro talks about in, in his new book. Uh, uh, we're living in a time of disintegration. Like all of the norms seem to be crumbling. And, and for, if you're looking at it through the lens of an election, well then, do you think that Biden is gonna accelerate or slow down or reverse the disintegration? Or do you think that Trump's gonna do that? And I think, I think most people think, well, Trump's trying to at least restore something and, and Biden, whatever it is. Uh, so speaking of disintegration, the new AP style book guidelines are now recommending that um, journalists, and I, journalists uh, use the word unrest instead of riot because riot is too politically charged. So the AP style book, for those of you that don't know, this is a book that the AP puts out, I think basically every year, they update it with a, a few things. I have one around here somewhere. I think we've got one in my, in my uh, drawer over there. Um, and basically they tell you the, the types of, in effect, how you should go about being a good journalist and a good writer and where you should put commas and parentheses and all of these things. Okay, so it's, it's a guide for how to do basic journalism uh, basic writing, you can think about it that way, okay? Um, and a lot of the stuff is stuff you learn in seventh grade, but then, you know, there's some deeper stuff than that, obviously. Uh, but now they're recommending that we use the word unrest instead of riot, and they put out a Twitter thread, and let's throw to it, I'll read it to you. Uh, this is uh, the new guidance on AP Stylebook Online. Use care in deciding which term best applies. A riot is a wild or violent disturbance of the peace involving a group of people. The term riot suggests uncontrolled chaos and pandemonium. I'll editorialize for just a moment there. That does kind of sound like what we've seen in Kenosha and what we've seen in Portland or what we've seen in Seattle and what we've seen in New York and what we've seen in Los Angeles and what we've seen pretty much everywhere. And why is that? Because it is, as they say, uncontrolled chaos and pandemonium when you see Molotov cocktails being thrown at police officers and people being hit over the head and you know assaulting people that are trying to sit at restaurants. That sounds like uncontrolled chaos to me and also pandemonium. Uh, the tweet thread goes on. Focusing on rioting and property destruction rather than underlying grievance has been used in the past to stigmatize broad swaths of people protesting against lynching, police brutality, or for racial justice going back to the urban uprisings of the 1960s. Unrest is a vaguer, milder, and less emotional term for a condition of angry discontent and protest verging on revolt. So we'll go back to camera for a sec. You see what they did there. They went, they started going from, we use words because words have 
of actual definition and fact to now, but there's a feeling we have about why people do certain things, so now we have to change words. That's very, very dangerous. The Twitter thread goes on. Protest and demonstration refer to specific actions such as marching, sit-ins, rallies, or other actions meant to register dissent. They can be legal or illegal, organized or spontaneous, peaceful or violent, and involve any number of people. So what they just said there, that's a lot of doublespeak right there. Protest and demonstration can be peaceful or violent. Uh, no, well, protest can be peaceful, demonstration can be peaceful, but once it's violent, that would be what you call a riot. I don't mean to be a stickler for the English language, but you know, come with me on this adventure. And then finally, revolt and uprising both suggest a broader political dimension or civil upheavals, a sustained period of protest or unrest against powerful groups or governing system. Well, that seems like what we've got now and they're doing it with riots. Now, I mentioned this story because on, at some level, you're probably listening to me and you're going, well, what difference does it make what the AP style book says? Now, as I always use quotes when I talk about journalists, um, I think probably the rest of you understand why this is important. Uh, first off, there's almost no journalistic standards anymore. So this book is trying to give some journalistic standards. They should also try giving some journalistic standards related to anonymous sources, but that's a whole other story. Um, what you're seeing here, though, is that when they're trying to change the language, they're trying to confuse our ability to have a common conversation. When, when one person sees a city burning down and Molotov cocktails and windows being broken and people being attacked and random people being shot and, and insurgent Antifa groups creating their own set of laws in CHOP in, in Seattle, uh, the average person would say that is violent, that is a riot. That is uh, untenable for a civil society. But they would rather you call it unrest because somehow beneath the exterior of the violence, beneath it is good people. These are good people and they're fighting for good things. So we don't want to say they're rioters, it's just unrest. And this is a manipulation so that, so that people will watch the same thing. And depending on what your political affiliation is or where your political leanings are, you won't be able to have a conversation with someone because you're going to say, you're going to watch it and go, that was a riot. And they're going to go, no, it was just unrest. And then you're going to fight each other out and it'll most likely end in a riot. This is a problem. This is a real problem. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but there was a book by a guy named George Orwell. Uh, it was written about, gosh, probably about 70 years ago, something like that, around 1950, maybe. Um, and George Orwell in 1984, many of you of course know 1984, one of the things he talked about was new speak, okay? And I wanna, I wanna actually read to you what new speak is in this dystopian society that he believed would occur in 1984. Maybe it took a little bit longer than George Orwell thought, but new speak, this is the Wikipedia definition of new speak, although Wikipedia has got a little new speak in and of itself. Uh, the political purpose of new speak is to eliminate the expression of the shades of meaning inherent to ambiguity and nuance from old speak, standard English, in order to reduce the language's function of communication by way of simplistic concepts of simple construction, pleasure versus pain, happiness versus sadness, good think versus crime think, the last one of these which linguistically reinforces the state's dominance of the people of Oceania. So that's, that, that's the, uh, where they live is Oceania, that's the country that they live in. Um, if you haven't seen 1984, I mean, there's a movie, hopefully you've read it, but if, if you haven't done either one of those and you don't have much time, uh, I did a video with Michael Knowles uh, for the PragerU book club where we dissect 1984 and in effect we end up just talking about current events because there are so many phrases from 1984 and so much of the landscape politically uh, that George Orwell talks about is happening now. This is it. What once was science fiction is now reality. Words are changing in front of us. And what they're also doing is these are the same people who will say violence is not violence. Meaning if you burn down a building, that's not violence because you, there's insurance and no human, no person was hurt directly, right? So that's not violence, but they'll also tell you that words are violence. So that if you misgender someone, that's violence. Yet if they call someone else a Nazi, that doesn't count as that kind of word violence. None of it makes sense and none of it makes sense by design. And, and I think the more you understand that, the more you can make sense of the world. And actually that does bring me to an interesting point, which is I was on Twitter this morning and I was thinking, you know, and I tweeted something out about this. 
it, it seemed crazier than usual. Like things do seem crazier than usual. And it, it's partly because of what I just talked about where we're all seeing different versions of reality. And as I've been saying, there's a war on reality. That's what's happening right now. Um, but the people that are making sense to me right now are the people that are honestly looking at the world as it is, not as they want it to be. But if you only look at the world as you want it to be, you will be endlessly miserable because guess what? You don't own the world, buddy. You can work to make it better, but you don't own it. Uh, speaking of working to make it better, I got one other story that I'm gonna do relatively quickly. Uh, Coinbase CEO, his name is Brian Armstrong. Uh, he issued an interesting statement uh, and it's got a lot of people pissed off. And then the, the former CEO of Twitter got involved. And I'll get to that in a second, but he just poured gasoline on the whole thing. So uh, Brian Armstrong said that basically he wanted to get, in effect, what he wants to do is get social justice out of his company. I, I don't know where he stands politically, but he understands that once you let these ideas in and then everyone's fighting about everything, that you're gonna go off mission, right? And I've talked about this a bunch and, and Peter Bogosian, who's a friend who I've had on the show many times, he talks about this. If you let social justice into an organization, whether you think it's good or bad or indifferent, once you have people focusing on how many black people should we have and how many Asian people should we have and how many gay people should we have, you've already directed resources away from the goal, which should be to make a better product or sell more stuff or whatever it is, uh, you know, have a better hotel, whatever business you're in, you've directed resources to things that are in many ways uh, contrary to what the original business motivation is, okay? So, uh, so in effect, CEO Brian Armstrong, this is what he said. He said, while I think these efforts, talking about social justice, are well-intentioned, they have the potential to destroy a lot of value at most companies, both by being a distraction and creating internal division. Now that is true. There's no doubt that that's true. It's true for the reasons that I just said. It's true because then everyone is hung up in human resources fights. You're gonna have, if you're hiring people based on immutable characteristics, you're not gonna hire the people who are most qualified. We used to call that uh, racism. If you hire people based on the color of their skin, you know, I'm, I'm old school. Uh, so this creates a whole series of problems. And he's just, in effect, the, the CEO of Coinbase is basically just saying, hey, I, you know, we do Bitcoin, we're an exchange for, for crypto. That's what we want to focus on. We don't want to focus on all this other stuff. And as the CEO of the company, he has the right to do that. I'm, I'm the uh, CEO of, well, technically, I guess I'm the COO of uh, David, my partner, my husband is the, is the CEO of our production company, but we make the decisions and, and we, that's what your right to do is. If you own a business, you have the right to create the culture that you want. Well, then former Twitter CEO Dick Costello responded about this, and, and this is just a doozy. He said, me first capitalist, who think you can separate society from business are going to be the first people lined up against the wall and shot in the revolution. I'll happily provide video commentary. <sighs> he is partly right here that yes, they will go for capitalists, they'll, they'll get you. Of course, uh, Dick Costello, you're not gonna believe how much Dick is worth, okay? Dick's got a lot of dough. Dick is worth $300 million. Dick has done quite well uh, in our capitalist society. I don't know what level of social justice or, or money he gives to organizations or any of that stuff. But what he's doing there is, is this, if you're, if you're curious, we're defining a lot of things today, if you're curious what's, what virtue signaling is, this is virtue signaling at its height. This is a man who through capitalism and through creating Twitter, which might ultimately be the, the most evil thing in the history of human society, uh, cr created tremendous amount of wealth. As I just said, he's worth $300 million. Now what he's trying to do is say, ah, but I see the barbarians are at the gates. I see you guys are coming. You guys are about to burn the whole thing down. Hey, can I film it? Can I film it? Can I film it so you'll spare me? And that is virtue signaling. You have no virtue that you're gonna film as they bring your friends and former coworkers to the guillotine, man, that is cowardice of epic proportions. Lordy, lordy, lordy. All right. Uh, that is the Rubin Report direct message for today. Uh, I'll be back on Tuesday with more. Uh, wanna remind you guys that uh, we, yesterday we did the, uh, I hosted it here on the Rubin Report channel. Uh, we did about a two and a half hour gathering. It was the Freedom Fest emergency session. 
And I, along with Mark Skousen, who is the uh, founder of Freedom Fest, uh, we interviewed about 20 people, a couple of the people you'll, you'll recognize from the Rubin Report, including Michael Malice and Matt Kibbe and a couple others. Uh, and it was a wide ranging talk, all sort of focused on freedom and liberty, but we talked about it from a political angle, from a COVID angle, from a big tech angle, whole bunch of stuff. And I think you'll find it really interesting. You can just kind of jump in and out and, and skip around, but the conversations were were pretty enlightening. And uh, and the reason that we did it online, by the way, is because we were supposed to do it in Las Vegas in August. The event was canceled. I was really looking forward to it. I haven't left LA once since this stupid lockdown began. And uh, and I said to them, basically, I was like, look guys, I would love to host this on my channel so we can get these ideas and, and voices out there and, and all that stuff. Uh, anyway. Uh, have a good rest of your Thursday, everyone. Enjoy your Friday and your Saturday and your Sunday and Monday's all right too. And uh, I'll be back on Tuesday and we've got some more interviews coming up. Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian presidential candidate. I believe that's what we're putting up next. And uh, that's all I've got. I will continue my list of people to condemn because I feel like I left off some people. But but for sure, I'm not, I'm not condemning the, uh, well, I was gonna say the Autobots, but you know. They're not perfect either. All right, see ya.